Thanks for joining us. I'll give you guys a second to grab your seats. Or if you want to remain standing, that's okay as well. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. We really appreciate you uh, coming out and being flexible and and being a part of being a part of what we're doing right now, which looks a little different, as you can obviously tell. I'm going to pray for us as as we begin our service today. God, we thank you so much. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the ability to gather. We thank you for a community of of people, a community of believers to gather with, Lord. And and we we pray that you would focus our hearts on you today, that we would bring you honor and glory, that we would move closer to you um, through through our our time in in singing and in worship and our time of, of learning from your word in our community with one another, Lord, that all of that would work together. Um, to move us closer to you, closer to your heart for us and for our church. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, welcome. Really good to see you. If you haven't yet uh, met me, my name is John. I'm I'm the administrative pastor here. I'd love to meet you. Um, We're so glad that that you've joined us. And if if you are newer and you're looking to get connected, um, it's pretty easy through our website to reach out to us, and we'd love to kind of help walk you through some of those steps. Um, we'd love to meet you, get to know you. So thank you so much for being here with us. If you call LifeBridge your home church, we ask that you give. And that's right now especially easiest to do uh, online or through uh, Venmo, through our um, our app. There's a, there's a few easy ways to do that electronically. You can also mail or drop um, uh, donations off at, at our building. But we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your giving. We thank you for... Um, generously continuing to push our mission forward. The last, uh, the last kind of announcement we have is we've got, a, we've got a new calendar rolling out in the fall, but we, we do want to let everybody know that um, we are planning on extending outdoor church. We are planning on doing what we're doing right now through the end of September. That's our plan at the present. So unless something changes, uh, right now you can plan for that. We will be here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. until October, and then at that point we would be moving back to our building and uh, the restrictions. We don't know exactly what that'll look like at that point yet. There's still some things that could change, but basically our plan is here until the end of September, back at our building after that, and uh, go from there. What's up, dudes? How are the Sisler boys doing? Good morning. Good to see you. I like those guys. They're good dudes. Okay, we're going to talk just for a minute today. I, I spoke last week for a minute. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about moving forward, what it looks for us, what it looks like for us as a church to move forward. In um, in this time that is that is so strange, I think we've um, we've a lot of us have had different experiences of sort of feeling stuck, sort of feeling like they didn't know the way forward. And I want to share a little bit of my heart and a little bit of a vision for for where. We feel like God is calling us to as a church through this season, and and as we've been saying, when we talk when we talk about moving forward, we're talking about moving we're talking about moving through this season. We're talking about moving through COVID nineteen and through the challenges that come with it. Not moving past it. Not simply leaving it in our rear rearview mirror. So we always want to clarify that, but but we do need to move forward through this season. And I want to start by by uh, sharing a little bit about sort of just the personal struggle that, that I've, I've had over, the, over these last few months. And, and what we're talking about today is accepting, accepting our circumstances, accepting our circumstances as, as being a really important step that we have to take if we're going to move forward together as a community, as, as, as members of one f- church family and one church body. It's important that we accept our circumstances to do that. And for me, there was a time when... Um, there, there was a time um, during this pandemic, and you guys might be totally aware of this just b- based on like talking to me, but um, it was really hard for me. It was a, what, what was maybe the hardest thing for me as a, as a pastor is I'm generally the guy, if you ask me, like, where do you want to be in five years? What's the future hold? Any sort of big picture question, I generally have answers for those questions. And when, when the pandemic happened and sort of every, everything with that happened, all of a sudden, I felt like I didn't have any answers for those questions, and and it was a really difficult time. I was sort of a wreck, to be honest with you guys. It was like a really, it was a really crazy experience to be like. I felt so 
paralyzed. I felt like we couldn't plan anything because everything was changing so quickly, and we didn't know what next week was going to look like. And so, yeah, it was it was tough. Ask people who asked the staff, asked definitely asked my wife or asked Pastor John, like, what was it like? It was there were some. I was I was ornery and I was weird and, but um, I think I think ultimately. Ultimately, one of the things that was happening with me is I was, I was just struggling to accept what was happening. I was struggling to accept, um, I was struggling to accept this, this season that was going to look different. And I, um, there were times when I was super anxious. There was times when I was angry. Um, and it wasn't, until, it wasn't until I realized I, sim- I just simply had to be done with that. I had to be done, um, basically I had to be done getting bent out of shape about, about, what's happening right now. I had to be done. If this thing gets canceled or, or this order comes down or now I have to wear a mask and before I didn't have to wear a mask, whatever those things are, I just had to, in my mind, I just had to switch gears and say, none of this stuff is going to get me bent out of shape anymore. I'm just going to do what I need to do. And that really for me was the first step. And I want to talk with you guys just for a couple minutes about it today, about how important that is for our church as we move forward. And a lot of it is about, it is about those emotions of, of how we've processed through those things. And a lot of us have been, I've talked with a lot of people who have experienced different levels of really what, 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 what I would call anger over what's been going on. Anger about changes to their life, anger at what the government's doing, anger at how other people are, are behaving and whether someone's wearing a mask or they're not wearing a mask or they should be wearing a mask or they shouldn't be wearing a mask. We've, we've dealt with a lot of anger through this. And... Um, I, I really I really believe that a, a big step forward, a big part of it, the, a part of getting us unstuck and moving forward is simply working through that and processing that. And for me, I think one of the one of the moments that that I realized that I had to do that was when there was a there was a rule change. There was a rule change. This was a while ago that it, everybody said was coming. There was no doubt that it was coming. And when it happened, my first instinct was to be angry anyways. And I was just like, what? I could have prepared. I should have been prepared for this in my heart and in my emotions because I knew it was coming. But I think the, everything was so raw and, and I was still angry. And that was, that was a moment that made me realize, like, look, I need, to, I, need to, I need to prepare myself better and I need to accept what's going on right now because I can't be angry for the next, I can't be angry for the next six months or eight months or a year or whatever it is. So as a church, if, um, if six months down the road, if nine months down the road, if we're still angry, that's, that's on us. It's not about our circumstances anymore. It's on us at that point. So I think that's a really big step for us. It's really important. It's time to be, basically, it's time to be done getting bent out of shape about it. It's time to just, okay, whatever, whatever happens, things are going to change. It's time to be flexible. It's time to extend grace. The one other thing, it's time, it really is time to, to, to shift our focus on is the idea of going back to normal. This idea of going back to normal is, um, I, don't think that that's, I don't think that that's a healthy way to think about what's going on right now. I think in my life, in the times that, that God has shaken up my life in some way, and I don't think that he does that so he can call me back to living the way that I was before it happened. So back to normal is, I think of the story of, of um, Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and Lot and his family are leaving, and his wife his wife, he's like, don't look back, don't look back. She looks back. She gets turned into salt. I don't think we're going to get turned into salt. I think that would be, I think Pastor John would call that bad biblical teaching. So I'm not going to say that. But I do think, I do think we need to stop asking, how do we get back to normal and start asking, okay, God, where are you calling us to in this season? Maybe it's a hard place. Maybe it's an even easier place. I don't, I don't know. But, but back to normal is, I don't think that's what God is doing. It, we just, I just don't see that as what God does with us, is try to restore normalcy for us. So I think we need to accept that that's not what's going to happen and look past it and desire, desire to seek what God has for us instead. I'm going to read to you guys from 1 Peter chapter 5. This is verse 6 through verse 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world 
is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So at that time, there was um, there was a lot of persecution in the church, and uh, and I think for us, the idea of casting our anxieties on Him and being alert and of sober mind, it it makes us less. Um, if we'll allow God to do that, and if we can have control of our emotions and and put our trust in Him, um, it makes us less. Uh, it makes us less open to the attack of the devil. It makes us less open to sin. It makes us less open to um, a harmful, you know, kind of toxic attitude that um, that can really can can harm our souls and harm our lives right now. So I want I want to I want to encourage you guys, but also challenge you guys that it it really if if you're still really struggling with anger around what's going on, if you're really struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with some of these things, to take a hard look at it. To take a take a hard look at what it looks like for you to process it, to to put to give it to God and and to be ready to move forward, accepting that this is going to be a weird time and the circumstances are different. That's an important step, and I'm going to continue talking about this for a few weeks uh, as 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 I look at sort of my own life and other things that have happened, but also also uh, reflecting that on the heart of God and and where our church is going. So so I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, John's going to come up here. Lord, I pray that you would help us, God, as a church. Lord, I, help that you would, I pray that you would help us to move through this hard season, to move forward. I pray that you would challenge each one of us in our hearts to cast our cares upon you, to cast our anxieties upon you, to be alert, to be of sober mind, to be aware of the ways in which our emotions leave us vulnerable to attack, leave us vulnerable to sin. God, draw us to your heart so that we can move forward together as a unified church community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please welcome up Pastor John Adams. Thanks, John. Yeah, there was a time there where both of us were kind of just short, not like physically short, but just like short with each other, short with <laughs> everything in life. And uh, yeah, that was a rough time. But we are back. All right, hopefully this loads up or else I'm going to have to figure something else out. Give me a second. Oh, went on the wrong network. Hmm. Savannah, can you bring my phone up here real quick? All right, so what we've been doing over the last few weeks is going through the Psalms. We've been talking about developing this inner life with Christ and how, how we can meditate on God's Word, meditate on the important things of Scripture and faith. Thanks, Ellie. Um, and just develop this inner life. That is one of the biggest encouragements that I can give to you uh, in this time and that will, I think, help you grow no matter what season we're in, but especially this season. It will help you grow in your faith and help you to stay constant through all of these turbulent times like this, is having this inner life to lean on. Um, Last week, we talked about making Jesus Lord of your life in every area of your life and surrendering those major areas to him. Today, we're going to talk about following God's word, following God's law, uh, the moral imperatives of scripture, what Jesus calls us to. Um, we're going to be in Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm in the book, and it's all about uh, showing love for the, the law, Okay. Um, the law in our circles gets a lot of uh, <laughs> bad press, we could say. Um, but Psalm 119 is all about showing it some love and just giving, loving the law that God had laid out for the people of Israel. Okay? And I know this is a foreign concept to us of loving law. Okay? We have to kind of zoom out a little bit and get a bigger picture because laws most often just feel like restrictions to our personal freedom that are unnecessary. 
Uh, but when we zoom out and think about it through this lens, when you read through Psalm 119, and of, and of course things are different. We're not a theocracy today. We're not uh, under, our, our whole nation is not in the sense of Israel in the same ruled by God like that. I, we get that. We can parse that out um, at another time. But we are still, laws are important. Laws are good. That we need them. And Psalm 119 really brings this out, especially God's laws. The moral imperatives that we see throughout the New Testament, those are very important, and we should love them, we should cherish them, and we should cling to them. Because or else we wouldn't know who God is. We wouldn't know how God wants us to live. Imagine without Scripture, without the, the teachings of Jesus, without the Sermon on the Mount, without the Apostles' writings. Imagine trying to live life. How do we know if we're behaving in a way that is pleasing to God? How do we know if our thoughts are pleasing to God? We'd have no guiding compass for our life and for our day-to-day -day actions and thoughts. But because of Scripture, because God speaks to us through Scripture, we have this. And therefore, we should cherish it, love it, and abide by it. So in this psalm, this is a beautiful psalm. It is very poetic. It is very well written. Each section in your Bible is likely broken up by a uh, Hebrew letter. Um, so this one is the bait. Okay, you guys want to say that with me? Bait. Good, knew that was terrible, but whatever. It's a Hebrew letter. Okay, it's, it's like B. We'll just call it B. Um, there, every line in the beginning of this poem begins with a B, a bait, whatever. It's incredible the amount of time and energy and devotion that the psalmist devoted to this psalm. And to talk about how amazing the law is, the whole chapter is about this. So we're just going to cover uh, verses 9 through 16, just this short section. And the psalmist here uses uh, eight words to describe the law. Um, they're pretty similar to the concept of Torah, but each one has a slightly different nuance. We'll go through those in the devotional, and I'll kind of tease them out a little bit as we walk through it. Um, but for, for each of these, the psalmist is just heaping praise on the law. He, he's going to tell us to, um, to, to meditate on it, to delight in it, to consider it, to rejoice in it, speak, teach, to hide it or store it up, to seek God. Okay, all of these are good verbs that we should cling to. So today we're going to talk again about how to walk according to the law and how to follow God's ways. And what the psalmist says here is that the proper way to follow the way of God is to develop this inner life and these inner factors. He doesn't say, you know, buy this one book that is going to like give you a good behavioral change, that's going to be a quick fix, and then, hey, you'll, you'll follow the law right. He doesn't say, uh, just get up and make your bed in the morning. That's not, that's not Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 119 is not, just wash your face. Right, like things like that. These like good self-help tactics. No, these are developing inner life qualities. Everything that he says in here is directed towards that. Okay, so those self-help things can be good, can be helpful, but when you talk about how how are you are you struggling to maintain holiness? Are you struggling to follow the way of Jesus? These are the things that we should be focusing on in developing. So, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. We're just going to read it. We're going to go through it pretty quickly. And then uh, we're going to sing together for a little bit. I'll come up and apply it. Uh, we're going to take communion today. So, if I forget to say it later, if you're not comfortable taking communion right now, we totally get it. We prepared it with as much um, safety and precaution as we could. Um, they're all spaced out on the tables up here, so you can come and take one. Um, but if you're not comfortable, we get it. We totally understand. So, Psalm 119, starting in verse 9. Psalmist writes, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? So first he calls us to the, 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 the youth aspect of life, that time in life, when it's often tumultuous, it's often difficult to stay on this path of purity. Temptation tends to pull you in any and every direction in your youth, and he says, how can a, this young person in this difficult time of life stay on the path of purity? 
Purity is not just referring to the type of purity that we tend to think about, like purity culture. It's referring to holiness. It's referring to just living a righteous life before God. The psalmist answer is very simple in theory and difficult in practice. He says, by living according to your word. Word refers to everything God has spoken, the, the law of the Old Testament, the promises to Abraham, everything that God has spoken, everything that God has said, living your life according to the word of God. So the word of God is the guiding factor, the authoritative book, the principle that we build our entire life upon in our actions. We primarily see that in scripture. Now he's going to tease out what does this mean? What does it mean to live according to God's word? And as I already said, it's developing this inner life with God. He says, I seek you with all of my heart. Heart here is like the seat of the the emotions, but it can refer to just like the entire being, the entire person. So he's saying, I'm seeking God with all that I am. Do not let me stray from your commands. Commands here are the practical application of God's word. Do this, don't do this. And he says, I have hidden your word in my heart. The verb hidden can also mean like store up. It's like cherishing something that is precious. And word here, it it implies the promises of God. Okay, so he says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I've always read, I'll go through this in the devotion more, but I've always kind of read this as like memorizing specific scriptures to help me not sin. But I think the sense that the psalmist is getting at here is pay attention to the promises of God, that God has promised to remain faithful in his covenant no matter what, and despite your sin, that he will be faithful to you. And when you look at the beauty of that covenant promise, how could you then sin and betray him. When you look at those promises that God has given you, how could you betray him? If he is so good and so loving and so kind to you. Or he could be alluding to the promises that God has made that if you violate the law to the people of Israel in this context, if you violate the law, punishment will come. Just punishment will come. If you uphold the law, God will bring great blessing on the people of Israel. So he's saying, why would I throw all of that away? All of that blessing that God has promised, why would I throw that away by violating the law and sinning? He goes on in verse 12. Praise be to you, Lord. The word praise is more of a, a, a prescribing blessing upon God, saying, bless you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. He says, with my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. So he, he speaks them back to God. He talks about them. He's regularly saying them. And laws here is like God's judgments that he has passed out. What God has determined to be right and wrong, just and unjust, like a judge's judgment on a case is the context there. He says, I rejoice in following your statutes. What a statement. He rejoices in following the limitations that God has put on his life. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Band, you guys can come on up here. I'll unpack this and apply it in a few minutes after we worship, but for now, would you guys pray with me? Lord, God, we cherish your word. We thank you that, Lord, you are God who speaks. That, Lord, we don't go through life wondering, wandering about aimlessly, without a guiding direction, without a compass that shows us how to live, that shows us, Lord, who you are. It testifies to who you are, God, and who we are ought, and who we are and who we should be. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. For Jesus, you are the ultimate revelation of God to us. So, Lord, we thank you for your teachings. Lord, we thank you for the, the morals, the laws, the precepts, the statutes, everything that you have laid out for us. Lord, we rejoice in those. God, help us to live.
according to them. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with us? Let's sing together. If you want to sing along with us, and I hope you do, um, you can open up uh, lifebridge.church in your browser, and right there you can find all the song lyrics and, and sing along with us today.
ever breathe we live for you You guys can have a seat for a few minutes. So in Psalm 119, what the psalmist is talking about is his love and his devotion for God's word through the Old Testament, for God's law that he gave to Moses. And if you have questions about the 
The difference between the being under the old covenant and being under the new covenant in Jesus. Um, on Monday in the devotional, I kind of link you out to some resources that you can begin that exploration if you haven't already. Um, I will say that there's a lot of bad thinking in the church on this, or a lot of just confusion, and kind of it gets muddy and messy. Um, so this is an important topic for you to kind of dive into and to think through. Um, I don't. I take the position that Jesus fulfilled all of the law and that we aren't held to any of the Old Testament law as law. Uh, therefore, we look to the New Testament. So what you're going to hear me talk about here is the moral imperatives, um, the teachings of Jesus, and what the New Testament authors outline for how we should live our life. So that's the application for us today. But if you have questions about that, um, Monday in the devotional, sign up for it if you're not already. We'll go through it in greater detail so you can kind of explore that and get on that topic. Um, our big idea from the text is to pursue holiness by living according to God's word. Pursue holiness by living according to God's word. Um, I'm going to be assuming throughout the rest of this that you have asked yourself uh, the question of the psalmist, how can I keep my way pure? How can I stay on the path of purity? If you've never asked that question before, then that is a, a symptom of a deeper issue than what we're going to talk about today, okay? If you're not concerned at all with following the moral teachings of Scripture and following the way of Jesus, okay, that's, let's put it this way, okay, that's not like a, a squeaky brakes on your car where you can take it as a quick fix, right? This is like engine trouble that you're going to need to go back and possibly replace the entire system. So, so what you do then is really reflect on, is Jesus really Lord of my life? If I'm not even asking the questions, if I'm not even concerned about following the way of Jesus and, and, and wanting to live a holy life, if that's not a concern to you, go back to the, to the beginning. Is Jesus Lord of my life? Am I following him? Am I pursuing him with all of my heart? Those are the questions to ask yourself. For the, for the rest of our time, this is going to be very reflective. Okay, so if you're distracted and you're looking around and having a hard time paying attention and you're able to, like if you don't have to keep your eyes on your kids, right? I get that. If you're able to, you, like just close your eyes and just kind of meditate and think through these things as we're going through them um, to focus and to help you reflect because this psalm is very reflective and I want us to reflect on it and apply this to our own lives. Are we really following the teachings of this psalm. So remember, the psalmist asks, uh, what we're going to ask ourselves is, are we living according to God's word? And he outlines for us how we can evaluate this and some commitments that we should make to live according to God's word. So the first one I would ask us to consider is, am I seeking God with all of my heart? Am I really desiring God? Am I really seeking after God with all of my heart? Or am I seeking after something else? Does something or someone else own my heart? If you identify some things or even individuals or other people that are superseding God in your heart, we call those idols. If you are more passionate about achieving that goal, about getting whatever that thing might be or making that relationship a success, then you are about pursuing God and your relationship with him. That's, that's an idol in your life. Next, am I looking for God's strength to keep me from straying from his commands? Or am I going it on my own? When I face temptation, is it just me alone on an island trying to defeat that? Or am I leaning into the power that God has given me? We, as Christians, know through the teachings of the New Testament, that he's given us the Holy Spirit to convict us, to guide us, to lead us into holiness. And so we have the Holy Spirit with us, the power of God in us to pursue holiness. So are we going it on our own or are we leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit in us? Next, am I hiding God's promises in my heart? like a precious treasure? Am I hiding God's promises in my heart like a precious treasure? Like I said, when I started studying this text, this is one of those 
nuances that change the way I see this text. And honestly, it makes a lot of sense to me. Because in my life, when I finally started pursuing holiness, I had believed in Jesus all my life, but when I finally started pursuing holiness is when I surrendered my whole life to him. And then I got this sense of how awesome Jesus is, that he would die on the cross to forgive me of my sins, that he loved me, that he would never leave me, that I am saved by his grace and his work on the cross. When I got that concept of Jesus in my head, it was that beautiful picture of Jesus and how awesome he is and how lovely he is. That's what drove me to pursue holiness. It wasn't just a list of rules. It was God's faithfulness. It was his covenant faithfulness and promises through Jesus that drove me to pursue holiness. So what promises are you treasuring up in your heart? First, the negative one. That those who practice, and then Paul goes through a list of vices, will not inherit the kingdom of God. The promise that you are saved by grace, not by your works, so that no one can boast. The promise that you are a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come. If you're tore up with guilt about your former life, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The promise that Jesus gave us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That he is making all things new. This is a promise that we really need to cling to now. That Jesus in his kingdom, he is making all things new. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus promised that if he goes, that he will come back and take us with him to be with him where he is. These are promises we need to cling to and we need to hold on to and treasure them in our heart like a precious treasure. Next question, am I thanking the Lord for his laws, for his guiding compass of morals, or do I resent them as unwanted restrictions on my personal freedom? Last year, we talked in our Church and Culture series about how freedom is the value that we as Americans hold so dear in the political, the, the social landscape. Good thing. Okay, but be careful of how that bleeds into your concept of God and God's laws and our relationship with him. Can we rejoice and thank God that he has showed us how we ought to live, that he has showed us who he is through his word? Am I asking God to teach me his royal decrees? Or am I willfully ignoring them to claim that ignorance is bliss? <laughs> Only you know this. I don't know this. But are you purposefully disengaged with scripture so that you can claim, ah, I didn't know that. I didn't know I couldn't do that. Or are you diving into it to say, God, I, I need to know how you want me to live. I need to know how you would have me structure my life and my thinking and my behaviors. So I'm going to dive into this and I'm going to find how you want me to live. Next, am I speaking of God's judgments, his, his decisions of right and wrong and good and bad? And Am I speaking of those with others? <laughs> Yesterday at the uh, dinner table, Savannah and I had a conversation with our kids about utilitarianism and Thanos. <laughs> so, I don't know how it came up, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> are, we, are we able to talk about why something is right and something is wrong when we're confronted at work or at home or with something that's said on the news? When we're confronted with a moral dilemma, where do we go? Does our judgments on what is right and wrong look like God's judgments of what is right and wrong, good and bad? Or have we built them around some other framework? Either the most common ones are the greatest good for the greatest number, or autonomy, everybody decides on their own. Or is our moral framework built on what God has said? 
Because especially in times of cultural pressure like this, with COVID, racial tensions, the election year, we need to cling to the ethics of Jesus. There are a lot of voices pulling you in different directions that are away from the ethic of Jesus. In conversations with others, are we reflecting that? Do your actions right now and the actions you are promoting in conversations at work, on social media, around the house, do they reflect what Jesus would say and do? Do they fit with the Sermon on the Mount? Do they reflect God's love? That you love God with all of your being? Do they reflect that you are loving God and that you are loving others? Remember the foundations of Jesus' ethic? Or are we just kind of speaking whatever seems right to us in our own eye at the time? Am I rejoicing in following God's statutes, which testify to his character, like I rejoice in great wealth? I remember when my dad sold the farm. Like, remember the first time you got a large chunk of money? Okay, when you were a kid, think about that. Like, I think I was like 10, I don't even remember. But when my dad gave me a $100 bill after he sold the farm, kids, 100 bucks, what? I, I was, like, that was the most money I'd ever seen, right? Like, in my hand. I had no concept of money, but like, that was a lot of money right there, right? And I don't, I don't remember what I did with it. My mom probably made me save it for college or something. Who knows? And then I found out college is a lot more than 100 bucks. Um, <laughs> but I remember that feeling of just joy of having this money in my hand. Like, oh my goodness, I can do anything with this. Imagine that joy. Think of that, that euphoria that you would feel when you came into a large amount of money. And that's the concept that the psalmist is getting at. Like We should feel that joy in following God's law. Because we're acting like God. Be holy as I am holy, as Scripture says, right? When we are acting in holiness, we are acting like God, and that should produce joy in us. Then am I meditating on even the smallest details of Jesus' way so I don't miss anything? This is a big one today. Am I meditating on Jesus' way or something else? I think for most of us, we need to stop meditating on the news. We need to stop meditating on COVID. We need to stop meditating on our anger about COVID, as John talked about earlier. We need to stop meditating on the election and all of this stuff in the news right now and start meditating on God's word. This is why the disciplines are so important, why we read scripture. I encourage you to read scripture every day so that you can meditate on that and think about that instead of all of these other things that are pulling your attention in different directions. We memorize it for that reason. So that when we're confronted with something that is against scripture, we can go to that and know what Jesus has said. And then finally, do I delight in his decrees? I love that word, delight. You just take delight in Jesus' decrees and in the way that he has called us to live. So these are all commitment statements. Okay, you can find them in the notes on, on the website. You can find them there. You can find them in the devotional on Friday. You can just read the text. These are commitments that the psalmist is making, saying, I will do these things. So as not to be overbearing on you, if there was one that really stuck out at you as we were going through this, perhaps it was rejoicing in his law, speaking of God's judgments with others, meditating on his word, one of those that just stuck out to you, I want you to commit to doing that. Commit to that for this week and see how you feel. See how refreshing your soul is after doing that. We're going to go into a time of communion now. Again, if you're not comfortable taking communion, we totally under understand. What we're going to do is ask you to come on up and come up towards the middle 
And then if you're on this side, walk to that side and walk around to the outside. And same thing on this side. Come and grab your communion elements and come back to your chair. We will pray for them together. Uh, the beauty of living in the way of Jesus and knowing what Jesus has done for us is that we can commit to following the law all that we want. We can make all of these commitments and we know we're still going to come up short. We have come up short. We will fail. But because of Jesus and his work on the cross and his grace and his mercy that has saved us, we are justified before God. That it's not our merits that we're presenting to God to say, look at how good I am. No, it's Jesus. We're living in his merits that he has given us. He has imputed his righteousness onto us. Because if it was dependent on you following these perfectly, we would all fail. But because of Jesus and his work on the cross, and because we trust in him and we've surrendered our life to him, that we are righteous before God. But that doesn't discourage us from trying. Now, it's more of an encouragement. Like I said, when you see how beautiful Jesus is and the grace that he has given us, I don't want to disappoint him. I want to make my Savior proud. And I want to do what he's called us to do and live for him. So you guys, why don't you come on up, grab the communion elements, take them back to your seat. We're going to sing another song. And then I'll come back and pray for us. body was broken, your love poured out. You bled and you died for me there on the cross. You breathed your last as you were crucified. You gave it all for me. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. There in the ground, sealed in the darkness, life is laid. The frame of the Father, Son, in agony. He watched his only Son be sacrificed. He gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. Lord, we were sinful. You were perfectly holy. Lord, you fulfilled the law. You lived it to perfection. And yet, Lord, you still took our place. Lord, may your example of sacrifice for the benefit 
of others inspire us. Lord, may the confidence and the peace of knowing that you have covered all of our sin by dying on the cross for us and taking our place, may that give us peace as we seek to serve you and seek to love you, Jesus, because you are so good because of this promise that you have given us. So, Lord, we remember your sacrifice. We remember your pain. We remember that you have taken our sin in your flesh when you died on the cross as we partake together. Let's partake of the bread. with me for the cup as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us, your blood that has established, established this new covenant with us, Lord. That, Lord, blessing, judgment is not solely dependent on what we do and whether we uphold the law to perfection or not, but, Lord, it is based in our identity with you our faith in you, Lord, our trust in you, Jesus, that you have washed away our sin, that you have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we strive to be holy before you, knowing that you have taken our sin on the cross and you have washed us clean. We love you, Jesus. We remember your sacrifice as we partake together. Let's partake of the cup. Would you guys stand with us? Let's sing a little more together. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. King forever 
my sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. We really do owe it all to you, Jesus. You are the fulfillment of the law. God, help us to walk in your precepts, to be guided by you, to make you Lord of us life, of our life, in a way that actually changes our life. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. You have a great afternoon.